Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm your host, Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Uh, today, my guest is Josh Montgomery. Josh lives on the Big Island and he operates Guardwell Farm, where his family grows world-class coffee. He's also a founding member of the Ohana Aina Association. That's an organization of advocates for homestays, farm stays, and transient rentals on Hawaii Island. Josh is going to join me in a moment to discuss the current state of short-term rentals on Hawaii Island. Uh, there are a lot of members now on the Hawaii County Council that are starting to look at a law possibly regulating short-term rentals, and, and many in the community are concerned about that law. I'm going to ask Josh to talk about that in a moment. Josh, I'm so glad that you're able to join me today and uh, just appreciate the work that you're doing in the community. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here and, and happy to be representing the Big Island uh, talking about this issue. Tell me just a little bit about yourself, at least so that our viewers know who you are and what you do and why in particular you're interested in short-term rentals. Sure, so I'm a recently retired Air Force officer. I wrapped up 12 years in the Air Guard with the uh, uh, 291st out of Hilo, Hawaii. And uh, prior to, during my career in the Guard, I'm also an entrepreneur. I founded an internet service provider in 2006 and then founded a company called Mycroft AI that builds an open alternative to Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant in 2015. And we moved here to the Big Island in 2019 to start a coffee farm and, and have our kids attend uh, high schools in one of the, the safest counties in the United States. So well, you're, uh, you're quite an entrepreneur and a uh, member of uh, our community here in Hawaii. Now, tell me a little bit about what led you into getting involved as an activist with regard to short term rental issues. Sure. So when we moved uh, to the Big Island, we bought a small farm, five acres. And in order to make it sustainable uh, from the standpoint of being able to make the mortgage and to afford to live in one of the most expensive markets in the United States, uh, we took the home and divided it in half. So half of our home is a vacation rental, uh, which we have guests in on a regular basis. Uh, and then we live in the other half of the home. And, and really, that's the only way that our home is uh, uh, economically sustainable. And, you know, we're one of more than 7,000 families here on the Big Island that are in some sort of similar situation that make ends meet by renting a room or renting a portion of their home or, or renting an ohana to visitors to the island. Now, that's very interesting uh, because sometimes short-term rental is portrayed as being driven by an industry and uh, corporations. But what you're talking about in your own case, as well as many others on the Big Island, is that this is something where local residents are, are able to have a means simply to make ends meet. Is that right? Very much so. The, the big platforms like VRBO and Airbnb are about customer discovery, right? They're, they're the platforms that help to connect families that are renting a home with uh, visitors who want to stay there. Uh, but they're not really what's behind the, the success of the industry. You know, they they do mark up the nightly rate, but a vast majority of the money that guests pay to come and stay in our homes uh, goes to us and goes to the taxpayers. In fact, the taxpayers of Hawaii take home more money every night that my home is rented than Airbnb and VRBO do. I see. Now, uh, right now, the Hawaii County Council is considering some additional regulations on short-term rentals. Can you explain to us what those proposals are? and what, what kind of impact they might have? Sure, so Hawaii County uh, passed an ordinance in 2018 that regulated uh, absentee short-term vacation rent. So you could think of you know, a rich person from the mainland who bought a home and wants to use it as an STBR 50 weeks a year and then only comes for two weeks a year. Uh, that type of activity has been regulated for nearly five years now. Uh, the new ordinance that they're proposing is targeted at people like me and my family and, you know, many of our friends, uh, folks who rent a portion of their own home uh, to visitors in order to, to make ends meet. So it's a, it's a very different part of the market. Um, you know, in our case, because it's, it's a farm, the STVR plays a number of different roles, 
Uh, but one of those is agriculture, right? Is that we run a coffee farm and each time we have a guest come and stay, we provide them with a free sample of our coffee. And as you know, Kona coffee is the best coffee in the world, according to many, many, many folks. And so they buy a pound when they're here. And then many of them subscribe for a, a monthly shipment of coffee going forward. And so that vacation rental is for us a sales channel for our crop, right? It's a revenue source that helps to make our farm sustainable. Um, and then, of course, it's, a, it, it, it's providing a service for guests who come to expect a different experience when they come and visit places like Hawaii. You know, many folks no longer want that upscale hotel experience. They want to stay in a home that has a kitchen and has a little bit more privacy. Uh, that's maybe a little bit more affordable and we're providing that service for visitors to the island now in its uh, consideration of additional regulations the county council is relying on a distinction between hosted rentals and unhosted rentals could you explain a little bit about that yeah so the unhosted rentals are already regulated so that's where there's an absentee owner uh, what they're targeting now is, is folks who live in that home or folks who might have a second home where they rent a portion of it to a family long term and they have short term guests uh, also on that same property. And they've kind of justified the additional regulation by making the case that they'd had a bunch of complaints about, you know, the behavior of visitors in our communities. And the thing is, with hosted rentals. Uh, visitors have a tendency to to behave, you know, within the community standards, right? Because your your host is staying on the site, and we know that because after they started discussing this ordinance, they actually gave us data on how many complaints they've had. And for hosted vacation rentals here on the Big Island, they had sixty five complaints last year, and there were one point six nine million rental nights in that same year. So their complaint rate was 0.000062%. And yet that's a reason that they've, they've given for regulating our businesses here on the Big Island. And, uh, and there's a host of other issues uh, like that that have kind of come up during this process as, you know, unlike the absentee owners who aren't really here and part of the community, you know, we as hosted rental operators have been able to organize and start to tell our story. You know, for, for many of us, this is our livelihood. Well, that's fascinating, those statistics. It, it seems as though for hosted rentals, the complaint rate is exceedingly low. And uh, as you point out, the host lives right there on the property so that the values and the standards of the community can readily be enforced and monitored. And, and aren't there laws already regarding uh, noise and uh, illegal parking and uh, trash and, and so forth that could could be uh, enforced uh, I, yeah I think... for the for the rare uh, instance where there's a problem property the the county and the local government already have tools in place and as i said they already passed an ordinance in 2018 uh, regulating unhosted rentals um you know as far as i know they haven't even fulfilled filled the enforcement positions for the first round. And so they still have open positions, you know, to enforce the rules for their existing legislation. And the other big thing that, that really has kind of come up uh, is that the justification for the, the law, you know, the justification for, for making these changes and targeting, targeting our families um, has been affordable housing. You know, the, the idea that uh, if, we're hosting a visitor for a night that that's a long-term unit that could be used to house a local family. Uh, and yet, you know, that was the same justification for the law that they passed in 2018 for short-term vacation rentals. And if you look at the last five years, it's not as though that that legislation in any way increased the, the affordable housing stock in our community. And so, you know, between the complaints and the affordable housing issue, we're really struggling as a community to understand why this legislation is being brought to the fore. Like, like what is the problem that they're looking to solve? You know, people as a result of the, the regulations that are being put in place. So they're gonna require you to prove that all improvements to your home are permitted. They're gonna require 
floor plans. They're going to require parking plans. They're requiring all these additional requirements, despite the fact that they haven't had any complaints. And because of that, many people aren't going to be able to jump through the hoops or, you know, people may have purchased a home that had unpermitted improvements before they bought it and might not be able to get all their paperwork in order. Those people are going to lose their livelihoods. And in some cases, you know, those folks are going to lose their homes, right? And so that's a very significant impact. And so if the government is going to impact families in that way, they really need a strong justification for why they're going to put those laws in place. You know, when I joined the Air Force, I wrote a check to the federal government for an amount up to and including my life. It was a blank check, right? Because the purpose that the Air Force serves is very, very important. And for me, I was willing to make those sacrifices to fulfill the government's purpose. In this case, the government is making the case that families should be making sacrifices in terms of their livelihoods and, you know, having to jump through all these hoops and hire lawyers and all these other things. But to what end? Like, what is the, is the, the public purpose that's serving? And, and I think that's where we're really struggling as a community to understand what's going on here in the Big Island. Well, you did mention housing and uh, yeah. point out that short-term vacation rentals, at least hosted ones, don't seem to have much of a negative impact upon the locals being able to get housing. Uh, so what do you think is really driving this clampdown uh, that is going to increase regulations? Uh, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the elected officials. I, I really don't know what's driving them. I, you know, my, my conversations with them have led me to believe that they have the best of intentions. Um, but as we know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Um, you know, I think that maybe they do believe that it impacts affordable housing. And, you know, one of the things that we've asked them to do, and just recently, actually last week, we volunteered to, to pay $10,000 to this end, uh, was to actually go conduct a study and see what the effects are. Because in our case, the only way we can afford our housing is through short-term vacation rentals. So that's an enabler of our affordable housing. And I know of thousands of other families that are enabled to live here because of the revenue driven from this industry. So from our perspective, you know, this industry drives affordable housing. It makes housing affordable for local families. You know, the flip side of the coin is people looking at that and saying, oh, that Ohana could be long-term housing. Now, that discounts the fact that many, many, many of these properties are in no way appropriate for long-term housing. They don't have kitchens. They don't have adequate, adequate storage. They don't have, I mean, they're just not suited for long-term housing. But setting that aside, um, you um, know, the, by it could the way, be there. Go ahead. Let me just interject this and then let you continue. Sure. And if, we, and if we're talking about hosted dwellings, uh, then indeed, they, they may not be suitable for long-term uh, rental. Uh, be, because the, they may may not be set up for multiple families. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. And the and the county, you know, both here and in Honolulu County, have taken extraordinary steps to keep people from putting in second kitchens and keep people from increasing the density of their housing. And so, in many cases, the houses just aren't aren't suitable for long term housing. But the the thing is, is that before I build a home on the Big Island of Hawaii. I have to go and do studies. I have to do environmental studies. I have to do archaeological studies. You know, if you're building a larger development, you have to do traffic studies and utility studies, right? You as a, as a taxpayer, as an entrepreneur, are required to jump through all of these hoops to prove that you're not going to have a negative impact on the local community. You know, local government in this case has taken none of those steps. They haven't done an independent study of, you know, does it enable affordable housing or does it does it prevent it? Right. Well, we don't know because nobody's done their homework and they haven't done the studies based on the, the outcome of the 2018 law. And yet they're proposing additional regulation today. And so what we've asked them to do is to go out and commission a study. The Ohana Aina Association has committed a ten thousand dollars in matching funds to help to fund that study. So that the county can go out and actually do homework and do research and find an academic and have it peer reviewed to determine what the impact actually is going to be before we take steps as a community to impose regulation and additional hoops that are, I 100% guarantee you, going to affect at least one family's livelihood and are going to cost at least one family a home. 
you know, county government, a lot of times they, they look at regulation and they say, oh, it's just a small thing, right? You just have to go and get your safety inspection, right? Or you just have to, you know, submit this form to this guy, or you just have to jump through this small hoop. It's not a big deal, right? But the thing is, when you're working two jobs and you got a kid who's in school and you're taking care of your elder parent who might be suffering from dementia, right? And you're dealing with a car that broke down and you're trying to, you know, do maintenance on your home. That one little additional hoop that the government's asking you to jump through can be the straw that breaks the camel's back. You just can't do it, right? And so the county asking folks to prove that they have permits for every improvement to their home, to provide floor plans for their home, to provide parking plans, you know, for, and these are businesses that are already completely legal and are already in operation for which they've had no complaints, right? Is just adding a little bit more burden. And I guarantee you of the 7,500 families here that depend on this income to make ends meet, some of them, because of these hoops are not gonna be able to move forward. That's gonna impact their livelihoods and their quality of life. So we need a really compelling reason as a community to implement those regulations. And I just haven't seen those compelling reasons. What do members of the community say? Um, are, are people up in arms uh, against short-term vacation rentals? Or do you have support out there in the general community for hosted short-term vacation rentals? So for hosted rentals, you know, people really don't care. I mean, everybody knows somebody on this island that depends on that revenue to make ends meet. Everyone knows something. And as long as they're not impacting the local neighborhood, it, it's not really an issue. And as we've shown from the complaint numbers here on, on Hawaii Island, it's not an issue. This appears to be a solution in search of a problem in our case. And, uh, you know, to the credit of the officials involved, Right. They started this process by presenting the legislation before they introduced it, by seeking community feedback, by holding information sessions. Um, you know, they've been really good. And, and as near as I can tell, and I believe this strongly, they're operating with integrity and honesty. And so hopefully they listen to the feedback that they're getting from the community, take a step back, conduct the same types of studies that they would expect from us if we were going to make a change to our community. And then based on the data and the real world information that they generate, develop public policy that serves the interests of the broader community. Instead of just waving our hands over our head and saying, affordable housing, like, like how do we solve it? Well, you know, if, if they're really looking for a solution, the solution to not building enough housing, and I know that this is stunning, right? The solution to not building enough housing is build more housing pretty straightforward solution. And there are tons of contractors and builders out there that would love to build additional housing at a significant profit to themselves if the county would just get out of their way from a permitting and a studies and a regulatory perspective. And that's not just me saying that, that's the data saying. There is one major city globally, one major city globally that over the last 25 years has kept housing stock in line with housing demand, and that's Tokyo. And they did it by implementing buy right permitting, where if the property is zoned multifamily, you can build multifamily and you don't have to jump through five commissions and four neighborhood feedback sessions and all of these other hoops. If it's zoned for it, you can build it. And as a result, their housing stock has kept up, their housing costs have, have stayed steady, and they're one of the only major cities globally that's been able to do it. Why don't we learn lessons from our neighbors in Tokyo and build adequate housing instead of trying to take housing from families who depend on it for their livelihood, you know, and sacrifice it on the altar of affordability? Josh, you're certainly on the same page as the Grassroot Institute, which has studied and publicized the Tokyo model, as well as the fact that really on the big island where you live, less than 3% of all the landmass is devoted to any kind of development or housing whatsoever. The vast majority of the landmass on your island is simply undeveloped whatsoever. Uh, not that all of it is, is readily available for housing, but you certainly have enough land. So it's not the supply of land that's the problem. It's exactly what you pointed out earlier, the level of government regulation, uh, which is 
indeed uh, exceedingly high on in Hawaii County when compared to counties across the nation. Yep, and it's why Hawaii County is dead last, dead last, like last of all counties in the entire country in Hawaii in in housing starts, right? Dead last. You know, when a developer has to wait two years to get a permit, it's going to take his money and make money elsewhere, right? And uh, you know, the it it always fascinates me as we have these discussions about affordable housing. You know, when I want to regulate the auto industry, for example, you know, and you want to make cars safer and get more mileage and reduce you know carbon pollution and all these other things, one of the first people you would call would be an automaker, right? And you'd pull all the automakers in and you'd have a conversation and you'd figure out a way to make make things work, right? And you know, and in the case of the auto industry, they settled on a subsidy, right? A seven seven thousand dollar per vehicle subsidy to help them to convert to electricity. You know, when it comes to affordable housing, the people who really need to be forefront are the builders. And when you talk to builders, you just go talk to them, like go pick up the phone book and just start calling builders and ask them, like, why aren't you building more housing? One hundred percent of them will come back and say regulation. I mean, it's it's regulation, you know, and <laughs> and. So to blame short-term vacation rentals for the housing crisis on the Big Island is really looking for a scapegoat rather than actually dealing with the real causes of the shortage of housing. And so very much, very much so. And right. you know, when when doctors and I, I I wrote an open letter to the county commission last week, you know, offering ten thousand dollars for a study. And you know, one of the points I made is that when doctors take their oath, you know, they they make a commitment to first do no harm. Right. Like, you know, they're experts and they have the patient's best interests in mind. But at the end of the day, before they do anything else, the goal is to not hurt the patient. Right. And it should be the same for legislation. Like when we look at legislation, you know, yes, it can, you know, regulation does have a place. Right. And, and you know, I wouldn't want to live in a community that, that that had no regulations about anything. like, you, you know, anarchy is if you want anarchy, like go live in Somalia. But, you know. As we implement new laws, we need to look at it and say, who's going to be harmed by this? What are the unintended consequences of this? You know, should we do anything at all, right? If it's going to hurt people, unless we have a really compelling reason, and and uh, you know, in this case, there just isn't. As you go around the community and as you tell the story of of what's going on right now, what are you letting people uh, know about what they can do? in order to change the minds of their public officials? Yeah, so we're doing a couple of different things. Uh, we've got people writing emails and letters. Uh, we've had uh, uh, some of our community members who would really be impacted. I mean, one, one of the big constituencies that would be impacted by this is retirees. There's a, a whole group of retirees who bought property here on the Big Island that might have an ohana or a guest house that they count on that guest house income for their livelihood. Like this is how, this is their retirement plan. And if the county makes that illegal, many of these people don't know what they're going to do. Like they just don't have a, there is, when you're 75 or 80 years old, there is no starting over, right? And those people are really in a, in a bad place. So we've had them recording testimonials and we've created some videos just really telling the story of the people that this will impact. Um, and then, you know, we've encouraged uh, Heather and Ashley, Heather Kimball and, and Ashley um, uh, Kay uh, to ha host listening sessions. And so, you know, the, I believe over the next several weeks, they're going to actually be hosting some listening sessions around the islands that we're going to facilitate uh, so that they really can hear feedback from their constituents. And and I'm hopeful that that they listen. Right. And and everything I've I've seen as I've been speaking to them indicates that they will. Uh, and and you know withdraw this or you know we've actually proposed an alternate alternative bill that walks back a lot of these regulatory hoops and simply is a registration where you you register and say I'm running a vacation rental at this address if there are any issues you know this is who you call and you pay a small fee every year like something like that we'd be very supportive of it's the stuff that involves a planning department that's already two years behind on permits you know, and makes all of it contingent on the opinion of, of an unelected bureaucrat, those are the pieces that we're, we're really concerned about and, and we've asked them to, to take out. So 
we're trying to tell our story. We're trying to get the word out and we're trying to get folks to, to really communicate to the county council exactly how this will impact their lives. That sounds great. And I want to thank you for all that you're doing. If uh, any of our viewers would like to get a hold of you or Ohana Aina Association, how can they do that? Sure thing. Uh, they can visit us at ohanaainaassociation.com. Just do, do a little bit of Google. Um, join our uh, join our group. Um, you know, we're an advocacy group for everybody who's running vacation rentals on the island, whether they're hosted or unhosted. Our goal is to help tell the stories of the families that own and operate these and the employees who work for them. Um, you know, our organization is is rooted in the concepts of honesty and integrity and transparency are our core values. Um, you know, either they can join the group if they if they have a, a vacation rental and they want to have somebody out there speaking for them or just register uh, on our contact list and make sure that they're getting updates about about the legislation. Um, we'd love to hear more. from you. Well, Josh, I want to thank you for being on the program today. Appreciate all that you're doing and wish you the very best. And uh, viewers, uh, do get a hold of Josh and the Ohana Aina Association. They're doing good work. And until next time, I'm Kili'i Akina on Hawaii Together on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We'll see you again. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.